Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. This week we welcome Dr. Rochelle Walensky, Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, on a recent announcement of a shakeup at the CDC. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky recently said, to be frank, we are responsible for some pretty dramatic and pretty public mistakes during COVID, from testing to data to communications, it's the agency's responsibility to learn from those lessons and do better. Dr. Walensky has an ambitious plan to reset the CDC. And of course, it can't be happening soon enough as we are facing new hurdles. She's been in the post since 2021, and we always appreciate her taking time to speak with us. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Walensky, for being a guest again on Conversations on Healthcare. Always delighted to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're experiencing a BA5 outbreak as we talk with you. Soon, you and your colleagues will announce a decision on new COVID booster shots. I wonder if you could uh, share with our listeners uh, the process that you'll take to review the data to make sure that it's safe and secure for the American public. Yeah, well, maybe first I will say, um, you know, we have now given over 600 million doses of this vaccine in this country. So we have an extraordinary safety profile, probably unlike any we've seen with any vaccine in history. Um, the, what will happen over the next several weeks is um, uh, Pfizer and Moderna have put forward applications for this new booster for the fall, a bivalent booster, which is part prototype, the original strain, and part BA5. Um, as they do so, the FDA's um, advisory committee will review those data. The FDA will authorize that, um, should the FDA make the decision to authorize that vaccine, and then it'll come to our advisory committee on immunization practices. That committee will meet and put forward a recommendation to me and reviewing all of the data, and then I will put forward um, a recommendation for its use. So that, that is the process in the weeks ahead, um, and looking forward to being able to execute on that um, based on the conversations. Well, uh, you, you have questions flying at you every day at CDC, and certainly one of the uh, big ones seems to be the opinions about when's the best possible time to get a COVID booster shot. Should somebody get it as soon as possible when, they, uh, if, when and if they become approved, or should they wait until cases rise in the fall and winter, as we've seen uh, in the earlier uh, winters of the pandemic in order to maximize immunity uh, when it's really needed? Is that part of CDC's uh, role too, to weigh in on timing and try and educate the public as to what is maximally effective for them? Yeah, one of the things I will say is as we've rolled out our guidance, we have been, uh, our, for our vaccination, we have been, um, you know, our, our uh, the data on what these vaccines are good at and doing um, has changed over time. Right now, we know specifically with the Omicron variant, while they are um, good at preventing infections, they are very good, exceptionally good at preventing severe disease and death. And in fact, even to this day, as we have over 350 deaths a day still um, with this BA5 variant, as you noted, um, the people who are seeing most at risk of severe disease and death continue to be those who are unvaccinated or under vaccinated. And so I have always said there is no bad time to become up to date on your on your um, COVID shots. Um, if you haven't gotten a booster um, in the in the year of tw calendar year of 2022 and you're eligible for a boost, there's no bad time to get one. We are going to be reviewing data on um, these updated boosters, as I mentioned, coming soon. Um, but if you are in a place where you feel like you're at high risk of severe disease, if you're over the age of 50, if you're over, especially over the age of 65, and there's a lot of infection in your community, you may want to go ahead and not wait for that booster, um, uh, the information from that booster, get the one that is available to you now, and then we'll have further recommendations about when you can get an updated booster in the fall. Well, that's great. Dr. Walensky, just one more question on this, because yeah, there are other scientists that say the government is moving too fast and they believe the existing vaccines provide strong protection against severe disease. And some say the new booster raises questions because it involves studies on mice instead of humans. I'm wondering if we could give you a chance to respond to those uh, criticisms. 
Yeah, and maybe this goes back to the safety of those vaccines, which we know based on hundreds of millions of people who have received them are extraordinarily safe. As we have updated these booster uh, shots for the fall, the data that um, we are looking at is related to very, very small changes in the mRNA sequence um, and really shouldn't impact safety at all. Um, we're not expecting it will impact safety. There's there's always a question here of being too slow versus too fast. Right. Um, and I think one of the challenges is if we wait for those data to emerge in human data, not just mice data and human data, um, we will be using what I would consider to be a potentially outdated vaccine. Um, and maybe it's best, and I believe it is best, to use a vaccine that's tailored for the variant that we have right now. So we do know that the, the very you know, over 88% uh, of the sequences that we're seeing right now are BA5, 80, over 98% are either BA4 or BA5. So the strategy now is to tailor vaccine for, for giving us the largest breadth of response, um, ideally one that would um, have less waning over time, and that is by targeting the what I would say is the most proximal variant, the one that we have closest to us, which is BA4 and BA5. And I believe there's significant upsides to doing that with this um, updated bivalent back vaccine and very uh, little downside in doing so. So while we, um, I, I have heard those critics before, um, but I actually think it in a, in a time of um, we could either be uh, too slow or too fast, I really would love to be ahead of this variant this, this season. Well, uh, August is wrapping up. Labor Day is right ahead of us. And we understand that federal officials are preparing for a Labor Day kickoff for a booster vaccine campaign. We saw a plan online that talks about leveraging partnerships and engaging trusted messengers which really was the foundation of so much of what we did in the communities, I, I think, throughout the country uh, over uh, these last two years. But, but still, you know, we've hit walls around getting everybody to be vaccinated, even with the primary series and, and fewer, as you've noted, with the booster doses. Is there anything new, uh, dare I say, radical or new, different? Do you feel that there's a, a element to the approach that you're going to take that may really capture people's attention at this point. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, we recognize that we need to have ease in messaging. We really need to have people understand and the communications of who should get what when. And so that is certainly something that is high on our mind. Um, I don't want to get ahead of when this is actually going to happen, when we'll hear from the FDA, when we'll hear from the ACIP. But what I will say is time and time again, we've learned that um, we can make the recommendations, but it's you, the trusted messengers, the people who work with folks who are trusted all day, every day on the ground, who have been the reliable go-to through not just COVID-19, but through prior um, health challenges, um, through prior health care, you are the people who, who can deliver those messages for us and who we will continue to rely upon. One group also that I think is going to be critically important is our children. Um, we do have vaccine now for even our uh, youngest down to six months old, um, yet the uptake of that has been slow. And as we get our children back to school, we do really want to um, send the message that we know how we can keep them safe. Um, we have seen incredible safety benchmarks from even down to the youngest, and um, we'll continue to relay those data as well so people know that they can rely on the safety of these vaccines. When it comes to our children, um, COVID-19 during the pandemic has one, been one of the top five killers of our children at any age demographic under the age of 18 and the number one infectious cause of death during the pandemic. You know, uh, in addition to the internal review that you initiated, the General Accounting Office will soon release a report on CDC that's expected to be very tough. What do you think the GAO report will show? And in, in the interest of transparency, uh, will you be able to release the entire contents of your own study that you initiated? Um, yeah, so I can't actually speak to the GAO report um, prior to it being public, but I can certainly speak to our review. And maybe I'll just say that we took on two um, parallel processes. We took on a process um, that was led by Jim McCray that um, really looked at our COVID-19 response. How do we operate during uh, during a pandemic, if you will? Um, and what are our um, what did we do well? And what are some of the challenges that we had? And, and how can we learn the lessons of our response um, in our everyday operations at CDC. We also wanted to take at the same time a review of um, of 
are just baseline systems, processes, policies um, that uh, may not incentivize people to work in the optimal way that they do. And um, so we took on both of those reviews. We uh, engaged in over 170 interviews um, with key stakeholders, both within the agency, within our response, but then importantly, outside the agency, um, government officials, prior CDC directors, other public health leaders to really understand their perspective. These are key stakeholders who um, understand CDC, utilize CDC, depend on CDC. And so um, in both of those processes, we've synthesized a lot of the work that we have ahead and um, those uh, will become public um, in the week ahead. Great. Well, we certainly know Jim McRae well from the Community Health Center world. We we're glad to see uh, that he was working on that review. But and we, a dear uh, colleague. <laughs> yeah, dear colleague. We uh, had the opportunity uh, recently to speak with one of your predecessors, Dr. Tom Preden, who uh, I, I thought had an interesting idea. He suggested uh, that it would be a good idea for you to hold a press conference. I think he even said an hour long press conference, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with all of the CDC experts to discuss boosters, the new school guidelines and any other questions that would help us towards this goal of more transparency and perhaps more engagement of the public. Uh, would you be open to that kind of press conference? Do you think it might accomplish uh, some good in terms of giving people a chance to really uh, hear uh, from you and your colleagues directly? Yeah, one of the things that we learned through this review from both Jim and our own review is that um, there was a hunger for more contact with our subject matter experts, discussion with our subject matter experts, um, press conferences with health reporters so that they could ask sort of nitty gritty health related questions rather than sort of just made uh, overall press reporters. Uh -huh. So um, we've taken that to heart. You have probably seen through our monkeypox response, we have had many more um, uh, press conferences in that regard. Um, we uh, have done more with regard to and did one when we released our COVID-19 guidance. So certainly something that is on the table and as part of really learning from what we had from the review itself is that we have have been engaging in more and more of these press conferences with subject matter expertise at CDC. You know, I think one thing that the public may not know is that while CDC receives a good amount of money, it doesn't have a lot of flexibility uh, in, in that expenditure. And let's say you could go to Capitol Hill and make anything happen. What's the one <laughs> wish you'd want the budget gods to grant you right now? Um, wow. You know, I can't synthesize it down to one wish, but I will give you uh, maybe top two or three. One is we really need um, sustainable longitudinal um, uh, budget lines that don't um, wax and wane from crisis to crisis. Um, the infrastructure in public health, our core capabilities, our workforce, our laboratory, our data systems, we need a sustainable investment that I would say is disease agnostic. One that doesn't, um, that doesn't uh, necessarily wax and wane as we talked about. We are now you know, looking at how we can utilize COVID dollars to help monkeypox resource efforts. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that I think are really challenging and it needs to be sustainable. It can't be, um, you know, borrowing from a prior challenge. So that I think would be one big one. Again, disease agnostic, sustainable resources. Um, the other is that uh, there are challenges in this review specifically. We identified challenges that didn't allow us to be as nimble as we otherwise might have wanted. Um, didn't allow us to see a full, full uh, scope of everything that we wanted. So there are, of course, challenges related to our data authorities. Um, do we have the, we, we wait for data to come in from our state and local jurisdictions, our partners, um, but we can't compel those data to come in. So we can't always see where all the cases of monkeypox mm -hmm. are or where all of the vaccines are or the ethnic and uh, racial diversity of who has been vaccinated. We can't compel those. Now we those data are starting to come in as you've probably seen. We um, have challenges with the Paperwork Reduction Act and the, and the delays that we have in setting up studies because of the Paperwork Reduction Act. Challenges related to our human resource authorities, how quickly we can higher, how quickly we can deploy, even during a pandemic. Um, and so some of these are, are they're, they're nitty gritty authorities. We're kind of in the weeds here, but they have really um, hampered our ability to be nimble in a time where it was so important to be nimble. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think in many ways you've uh, answered the question that was on the t tip of my tongue, but I'm going to ask you to expand upon it a little bit anyway. Certainly, 
uh, we did learn a lot wherever you were uh, in healthcare, just wherever you were uh, during COVID. Uh, and, and then monkeypox uh, appeared on our horizon unexpectedly, I would say, from our perspective. Uh, and we ran into some of the same issues uh, around uh, getting access to testing, the vaccine shortage uh, issues, and some confusing messages, I think, as we tried to explain to people different strategies for stretching uh, the vaccine supply. How do you think we're doing with monkeypox uh, across the country and, and really uh, taking the learning from previous experiences and, and getting it out there, particularly, I think, in terms of education, vaccines and testing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting to think about what are the parallels and what are the differences with these two outbreaks or one pandemic, one outbreak. Um, Certainly, one of the things that I think is very similar is, though we knew a lot about monkeypox by virtue of the fact that we had been studying it at the CDC for decades, which I think really helped us jumpstart things, um, most of the American public did not know about monkeypox. Most clinicians did not know about monkeypox. So we were scientifically more attuned and knew more about monkeypox, but we needed to educate America all of America, what is this disease? What should you be on the lookout for? How is it transmitted? And that was a huge heavy lift early on as this outbreak was taking hold. Um, the testing component was different. Um, we, again, we had a test for this. We had sequences published within days of finding the first case um, that were on our website. Well, the published sequences were old, actually. They were on our website within days so that people could easily find them. We scaled up our laboratory testing. We were talking to commercial labs within days of that first test to be able to scale up laboratory testing. But we have to educate America that not everyone can walk in and get a monkeypox test. You actually need to have a rash in order to be able to get a test. And then we needed to work closely with our state and local health departments as to how and who should be, um, uh, be able to send those monkeypox tests and how can we make sure that we're getting the right people to get those tests and get those results back faster. One of the challenges that we have had at CDC is again, the um, how slow the data were to come in, um, how slow we were to receive data from our local uh, jurisdictions to be able to then feed it back to the American people and back to our local jurisdictions. And that is not, you know, this is a partnership with the local jurisdictions that we are fostering. One of the things we learned from the review is how much we need to work more closely with our local jurisdictions and our partners in those ways. But we need to have data systems that allow fluid flow of those data. We were getting cases reports in some cases by by email, in some cases by um, Excel, in some cases by cloud. Um, that's not a productive way to be able to import our data. And that's really one of the core public health infrastructures that I think we need to bolster um, in the years ahead to make sure that our data systems can receive those data fluidly so we can feed them back out. So, so important. Uh, data unites us. Uh, anecdotes divide us. So having that information is so important. Uh, let me ask you about, because I think we're all sorting out Dr. Fauci's upcoming departure from government service, what that will mean. You've been, you've worked with him. He's a friend. What's the, maybe share with us a little bit about his, his departure, but what's the biggest piece of advice he's given you through the years? Um, maybe what I will just say is I have had the great gift and fortune of knowing Dr. Fauci for about 20, 25 years. Yeah. Um, he has been a mentor to me. He has been a colleague to me. And I've had the great gift of um, working with him closely over the last year and a half. Um, he's a giant public servant. He has incredible expertise and incredible wisdom. And, and maybe what I will just say is I wish him the very best of luck in his exciting next chapter, which is, I, I'm understanding, not retirement retirement, but just the next chapter. Um, and so I'm really thrilled for him and um, wish him only the very best. Here, here. And Dr. Walensky, many thanks for your time today. And thank you for our audience for being here. You can learn more about so many things and learn more about conversations on healthcare by signing up for our email updates at www.chcradio.com. Dr. Walensky, thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts with us. Always good to be with you. Thanks That's for having great. me. Thank you.